let's open the floor for any of your questions. So if you've got face mask questions, vaccine questions about uh, about uh, some of the questions that I wanted to take on today. One of them was somebody asked me on uh, what happens if forced or mandated vaccines come. So that's one of the biggest fears. I think if, if, if you have that fear, that's one of the biggest questions that we've been getting asked of the last week is what do we do if the governments try to forcibly inject a vaccine? Now, I will say this, you know, a law that breaks with our constitutional freedoms and rights is not a law. It's tyranny. And if you don't have that same attitude, I can't help you. But if somebody threatens your life, you have every right to protect yourself. That includes the use of force. And how you choose to go about using that force is your business. But, you know, I can tell you what I would do if somebody knocked on my door and said, we're mandating that you take this shot that we haven't proven is safe, that we haven't proven is effective, um, they would have a hell of a problem on their hands. And that that would potentially be very dangerous for that person knocking on my door. And, you know, again, you're going to you're going to respond the way that you're going to respond. But um, None of you should allow somebody to inject or put something into your body, into your children's body. There is no excuse if it's not something that you believe is right, especially if it's something not proven safe, not proven effective, uh, but predominantly safe. And again, if you don't want the trackers, the, the, you know, the microchip processing trackers that, 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 uh, that they're looking at, 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 you know, Bill Gates has these patents. Um, and, and Fauci has these patents with coronavirus vaccines. So we, we don't want... Again, follow the money. We don't want those things being injected into us, especially not being properly safety tested. Now, if you sit on the other side of the fence where you're waiting for the science on these vaccines and maybe you'll take one, look, that's your business as a free individual to allow that to happen to you. Um, but what is, isn't your business to try to force somebody else to get vaccinated because you're scared that the virus could spread as a result of somebody else not getting vaccinated. We already know that vaccines don't work for RNA viruses. We already know vaccines don't work for viruses that morph on a regular basis. There's not uh, really a great degree of e efficacy. And we also know that adjuvants and vaccines can trigger autoimmune diseases and create health problems. So again, you don't want to take this lightly. And so um, any law that or any law that would be passed that force mandates that you be having something injected into your body in the name of safety is a break away from the Constitution and you have every right to protect yourself and you should take every uh, step to protect yourself and your sovereignty. And, and it's those of you who don't look, that's on you. We, then you will have a consequence that maybe that um, that maybe you deserve because you didn't have the courage or the conviction to stand up for yourself. But you should be standing up for yourself at this point. Okay, let's see here. Uh, Michelle wants to know, what about face shields? Michelle, there's no great research on face shields either. I know in some practices where they're wearing a mask and then they're wearing additionally a face shield. And, now, and again, the premise is to, to reduce splatter. Um, the, the reality is, look, COVID-19 is not very deadly for the average person. Now, now, again, I'm not saying it hasn't killed people, and I'm not saying that that's not tragic, those people that have died, and that that's not a bad thing. What I'm simply saying is, look, this thing, really, as it's panned out so far, is not really shown to be any dangerous than any other type of viral respiratory infection. The people at greatest risk are on multiple medications and don't take care of their health. They, they have a lifestyle that has been conducive to the development of chronic diseases like lung diseases, heart disease, blood pressure issues, obesity. These are the people at risk. And those diseases are lifestyle choice diseases. So again, if you want, if you really, really, we could flip this the other way. We could say, look, those of you who struggle with those problems, really, instead of everybody focusing on a vaccine, what we really need to be focusing on is a healthier world. Look, take care of your own house, right? Get yourself in shape. Um, take care of your exercise. Take care of your diet you, because those things, diet, you know, heart disease, diabetes, all that's reversible. Uh, obesity, reversible with change, with diet and lifestyle change. And so again, if, you, if we take away the people that are at risk because of those lifestyle choices, then what are we really left with? We're left with a virus that's relatively harmless to the average person because they've done their proper housekeeping. They've taken care of their own bodies to the level that their bodies can take care of them. 
But when you abuse your body to the level where it can't take care of you, now you're at risk. A vaccine's not going to fix the fact that uh, that you're swilling down sodas and eating potato chips on a, on a daily basis and not taking care of your health. It won't change those things at all. Uh, Marie says, nice haircut, Dr. Osborne. <laughs> yeah, you know what? That was a glorious moment for me to get that haircut. I was getting a little frizzy uh, around the sideburns. So thanks for noticing, Marie. Uh, let's see. My sister went back to work at a grocery store and she has to wear something that looks like a welding shield. Uh, yeah, so going back to the, you know, to, the, to the shield or to the face shields themselves. Um, here's what I would say to those of you who are being forced to wear masks against your will. Um, legally, nobody can force you to do that. Now, your employee can re require it. They can make that a job requirement, but um, there's a way out of that, and that's, that's if you have a health condition um, that, that would prohibit you from, for, or that would harm you by wearing the mask. And so that could very well easily be done. You can just tell your health and health employer that, or your employer, hey, I have a health condition that re restricts me from wearing a mask because if I wear a mask, it actually hinders my breathing. Because that's one of the side effects of the mask is a reduction in CO2 or an increase in CO2. So you're actually increasing your CO2. Remember, oxygen is a rate limiting step for energy production. So when you're breathing in your own CO2, um, that's going to slow down your body's capacity to generate energy. It's going to slow down your body's capacity to deliver that oxygen to your tissues, which again, it's a rate limiting step for normal healing repair uh, of the body. So to wear a mask all day long and to have a boss that recommends that, um, you know, that's, that's the out that I would tap into is that is just to let them know you have a medical condition that prevents you from wearing a mask. Cheryl wants to know, if I want to wear a mask, what should I get? Well, if you're trying to be effective, again, if you're trying to be effective, you want to get something that actually is going to work to any degree at all, according to research, an N95 mask. But I don't encourage people to buy those because we want to make sure our, our medical staff members have access to those masks. So we certainly don't want to buy them all up uh, because that was a big part of the original problem was the shortage for of, of PPE for, for, I know I actually know a nurse right now that they're having to reuse masks because their hospital doesn't have enough. As much talk as we hear about there are plenty of masks, um, some of the hospitals still don't have enough masks where, they, where their workers are being exposed and they are being uh, on that front line of treatment. So Linda Lindsay says, I probably misunderstood what I heard, but I was listening to a guy this morning that said there were that there was legislation passed several years back that allows the government to force certain actions, including vaccines in such a situation. No, the government has no right. So you're all of you are protected by um, by what happened in Nuremberg. So if you follow history of World War II, the Nuremberg trials set forth precedent, legal precedent that protects you from be having to be forcibly injected with something that has no proven safety or efficacy. Now, those of you who aren't following the vaccine research, um, a couple of gentlemen, uh, RFK and, and Del Bigtree, recently sued the federal government to prove that vaccine, because their statement is that vaccines don't cause autism. And so there was this lawsuit saying, okay, prove it. Prove that you've done the research that proves that vaccines don't cause autism. And guess what? They couldn't prove it. They didn't have a single shred of scientific evidence that proved that. So they have to take that statement down off the CDC website that vaccines don't cause autism. So if you followed the news for any length of time and all these reporters were saying vaccines don't cause autism, you know, it was kind of this, this, this mass push in the media to say that vaccines don't cause autism. The government can no longer say that because they couldn't prove it because they didn't have any evidence because when we sued them for the evidence, they couldn't provide it. And the same thing's coming. Vaccine safety and efficacy the same lawsuits are, are going to be rolling out soon where the safety studies on vaccines have not been done. The CDC has been lying and, and sliding this stuff under the table. Um, and so, and so, look, nobody can force you to do anything with your body unless you let them. Law or not, you always have a choice. And one of those choices might be that you uh, break a law to protect yourself from a law that isn't really shouldn't be a law or a mandate that, that isn't a law. So again, you just have to be willing to pay the consequence of whatever action that you take. Um, but if it means preserving your health and preserving your integrity, then, you know, again, it's your choice to make. Lisa wants to know, is it possible to reverse liver fibrosis through functional medicine? I've heard alpha lipoic acid and therapeutic doses will regrow healthy liver tissue. Is this true? 
it is possible to reverse liver fibrosis through functional medicine. As far as whether or not alpha lipoic acid and therapeutic doses regrows healthy liver tissue, I haven't seen any studies or research that show that to actually be true. Your liver heals itself. Your liver is a very fast healer, just like your skin. Your skin heals itself. If you get a cut, right, the cut naturally heals. You don't have to think about it healing. It just does it. Well, your liver heals as well if you take away the thing that's creating the damage. What functional medicine shines in doing is finding out what's causing the damage as opposed to trying to treat or mitigate the symptoms of the damage, which is what traditional medicine focuses on. Uh, let's see. I've been taking NAC here, but I believe we may have some gene mutations preventing our bodies from making our own glutathione without any recommendations. Um, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of things that you, can, that you can do to improve your antioxidant function. One of the best things that you can do is just eat real food because a lot of the free radical damage comes as a result of processed chemicals, exposure to food preservatives and other things in the food. So eating real food because your natural fruits, vegetables contain very rich quantities of antioxidants, especially organic varieties. Other things that you can do for antioxidant, nutrient antioxidants, is get your nutritional status checked because there are certain nutrients, for example, like zinc and selenium. So you may have a nutrition or a genetic uh, reduction or reduced capacity to generate your own glutathione, but that doesn't mean you don't have glutathione. So you have to understand a lot of this genetic stuff, people think, oh, I have bad genes. It's not that you have bad genes. You just might not make as much as somebody else, but you still make it. So you can preserve glutathione with selenium. Selenium helps regenerate glutathione. Vitamin B2, riboflavin helps uh, regenerate glutathione. So there are plenty of things that you can do. Uh, Tracy wants to know, what credence do you put in a second wave this fall? Look, my, my bets are we're going to see a massive second wave. I'll say a false massive wave. You have to understand, again, this is my opinion, but beware the government media complex. Um, those aren't my words. Those are, are, are words of other smarter gentlemen than myself, but the government media complex, the there are parts of the government that I truly believe are in cahoots with the media, and that's why if you look at the media message, it's repetitive. No matter what channel you listen to, you hear the same verbiage over and over and over and over again, like social distancing, right? You hear that being repeated in the new norm, the new norm. These are all this repetitive, um, this repetitive verbiage that you keep hearing from all the media channels, regardless is a form of psychological conditioning, meaning they're trying to condition your mind psychologically to accept something to be the new norm. The only new norm you should be accepting is a better, brighter future for yourself. Do you think the new norm is to hide in your house from a virus uh, that has a low mortality rate out of just the pure fear because you've watched the news and, and you're seeing, you know, now the, the, some of the politicians like Fauci, now they're wearing face masks. First they said don't, now they're wearing them. To me, this is, this is my opinion that they're trying to create that greater degree of fear. They're trying to prime you for that second massive wave. And that, again, as false as this first wave was, this first wave was nowhere near as deadly as we were told. It was nowhere near as infectious as what we were told. Uh, and, and again, if you go back and watch my last series on this, you know, the, the whole original reason why we shut down the economy, why we sheltered in place, had nothing to do with preventing the spread of the virus. You have to go back and remember, and, and, and using the politicians' words and holding them accountable for what they said, they, they shut down everything to flatten the curve. It's not the same thing. The, you know, Fauci was, was caught on tape a number of times saying, we're not going to stop the spread of this virus. The only, way you can really, uh, the only thing you can really do is flatten the curve, meaning to preserve the integrity of the function of our hospitals by not overwhelming them in the very beginning. And that's what the whole point of the stay at home, the shelter in place was to reduce the potential that we overwhelm the hospitals. The hospitals are not overwhelmed. They're furloughing nurses and doctors. They're firing people because because they're so underwhelmed. And so, and so again, flattening the curve was, you know, maybe we could say that because we stayed home, it was super effective. But, you know, if the treatment's worse than the cure, in other words, if you kill the economy and crush people's dreams and livelihoods and ability to earn a living, in the name of a virus with a 0.1% mortality rate, that's, that's a scenario where the treatment is worse 
than the disease itself. You could say, yeah, we, we treated the disease and the disease is cured, but the patient's dead, right? It doesn't make any sense. And so that's kind of where we're at right now with, the, with all of this um, social distancing, shelter in place, all these draconian uh, mandates that governors, especially in, in, in states like California and Oregon and Washington uh, and Michigan, where, where they're passing these draconian measures that they have no authority to pass. They have, there's no, you have to understand they have no constitutional authority to change your law, to change the law or to create new law. And, and so it's, it's the citizens. It's up to you. If you allow them to do this, then they will. If you allow them to get away with it, then they will. Remember, power is not something they have. The government should fear the people, not the other way around. The people shouldn't fear the government or the mandate to the government. The, gov the people elect government and put them in place to handle the people's business. The government is not there to dictate what people do or should be doing, right? And if you don't understand that, you need to go back to high school and take, you know, your your um, your your basic uh, your basic classes all over again. Uh, anyway, we got off on a tangent there. Is there an impact from all this social distancing in our mi on our microbiome? Well, there's an impact on everything that's going on because you, when you stay inside and you don't get outside, like you're missing out on some great dirt. You're missing out on some wonderful bacteria that have the ability to help diversify your, your existing microbiome, which is a big part of your immune system. Remember that you're outnumbered by bacteria and viruses already. And these are healthy bacteria and viruses that you have. But when you, when you put a mask on and you over hygiene, you wash your hands 20 times a day, and you wash the surface of everything off with Clorox and Lysol, and you, and you develop this germophobic attitude, what ultimately happens is you minimize your own personal microbiome. You destroy the diversity of your own microbiome, thus suppressing the strength of your own immune system, making you more susceptible to infection. And there's plenty of research studies that show the accuracy of what I just said. Um, let's see, Kimberly wants to know, we've been at home for nine weeks with no exposure to others, eating healthy, taking vitamin supplements, and getting outside when the sun is shining. What else can we do to strengthen our immune system? I know our immune systems become weaker under circumstances like this. Thank you. So mitigation of stress, a big one, and a lot of people are stressed out right now because they don't know when their jobs are going to come back or they don't know if they're going to be able to make enough money to pay for the food this month. Um, so mitigating the stress, but you know, again, if, if you can't control that aspect because you don't know when you're going back to work. Um, sometimes mitigating the stress is taking action. So, so every week I mitigate my stress by taking action on the show. I I've been taking action to help educate and enlighten those of you who are following this pandemic issue at great cost to my to my um, personal safety. Um, but it mitigates my stress because if I can't speak the truth, like if I have to be silenced from being able to speak the truth, that, that harms me internally. And so for some of you, you know, you may live in one of these draconian states. Well, look, if you live in one of these states and you're stressed out about what's going to happen, then it's your, it's your right and it's your obligation as a citizen to uphold your rights. And that may mean going to a protest. That may mean marching and, and protesting, and that may be part of how you mitigate your stress. Other things that you should be thinking about doing right now is maintaining your exercise. Um, exercise is very crucial. Uh, whether you're exercising outdoors or indoors, one of my favorite styles of exercise is Tabata, T-A-B-A-T-A, -A -A, Tabata. You can look that up, Tabata workouts. They're four minute long workouts, but they can be very effective at maintaining muscle mass with minimal equipment. You don't need big fancy gym and gym equipment to do Tabata exercises because you can do Tabata calisthenics like push-ups and sit-ups and squats and lunges and things of that nature. Um, and that can help you to mitigate your muscle mass during this time because stress also, as stress is high, cortisol goes up. As cortisol goes up, it eats into your muscle tissue, causes muscle wasting. So you want to do everything you can from an exercise perspective to maintain your muscle mass during this high level of stress. Um, I love it. Denise says, that's why I served in the Navy was to fight for our freedom. I'm going to exercise that right. Amen, Denise. Thank you for your service. Um, let's see. Is it recommended to wear an R95 mask given that N95 masks are reserved for healthcare workers? Dennis, I mean, my look, my take on masks is they don't work. 
And that's not me saying that because I have an opinion. That's what the research actually says, that masks don't work to mitigate disease. So I don't, I don't think whether you have an R95 or an N95 or a bandana or a surgical mask or homemade mask or a sock over your face, I don't think any of those things are going to protect you or offer any degree of protection or offer any great degree of protecting you from others. That's one of the other arguments that we keep hearing with masks is the masks are not for your own personal safety, it's for the safety of others because people with COVID-19 can be symptom asymptomatic. You know what a person with asymptomatic COVID-19 is? It's a person that has produced their own antibodies and they're no longer, they don't have an infection. It's a person that got exposure but's making antibodies. So that doesn't pose or mitigate or create a risk for you. A person who's asymptomatic doesn't create a risk for you. You have to remember the basis for a lot of what they're saying about COVID transmission is, is based on false laboratory values. The testing services for identifying and diagnosing COVID-19 are marginal at best. They're, they're, well, I'll just be very frank, they're piss poor in their ability to really give you uh, a solid, yes, I am infected with COVID-19, or yes, I have the presence of COVID-19 through a PCR swab like that just the presence doesn't indicate infection and the presence does not also indicate the ability to transmit and so again a lot of the information that's been shared is like everybody's scared because they're talking about how highly contagious this virus is it's nowhere near as contagious as what the models predicted it to be and a lot of what they're saying about about the um, R naught which is the the level of contagiousness of a, of a particular disease is has been falsely exaggerated so again Again, this is my opinion, create problems, right? Create massive levels of fear, okay? Because people are gonna make bad decisions when like, like wearing a mask that doesn't work when they're in high levels of fear and that stress. And then when you create the fear, you create the split. When you create the split, you create the fighting. When people are fighting each other, they're not paying attention to what, um, to what the, um, well, there's an old saying, who watches the watchers, right? And the, our proverbial watchers are our politicians, or who, our CDC, our doctors that we put in charge and put in these positions. But who's watching them as they're making, uh, as they're making the recommendations? Let's see here. Um, Dory, my work makes us wear N95 face shield and gloves eight hours straight. I'm getting a constant cough and burning pain in my chest. Could I have developed chemically induced asthma from the mask? It's possible. You know, these masks are bleached. They are, um, you know, many people are sensitive to a number of different chemicals, including what could potentially be in that mask, but you also may be suffering from CO2. Uh, aggressive CO2 accumulation, which is re reducing your capacity for oxygen. So again, I, I would... Um, I would argue that medical necessity, if you're suffering a medical issue as a result of wearing that mask, you know, then hold your boss or hold your employee accountable because a lot of the, the big corporations are, are doing this. Like Costco is an example of a company that's making people wear masks to go in their store. They're making their employees wear masks. I refuse to shop there. Look, if you're going to mandate something on me out of, out of illogical fear, then you don't need my business. And, and, but when you're trying to work your job or keep your job, I understand that you want to keep your job, and, but you also at the same time have to hold your, your employer accountable for their decisions and their action taking, especially if it's not justified and it puts your health at risk. Uh, let's see, keep going down there. Johnny says, I have a really hard time believing that if you're sick, it won't help. The mask has to catch something. Johnny, I think one of the best analogies I've seen on the mask is a chain link fence trying to stop mosquitoes. I mean, literally, that is a, a really great analogy because the viral particulate is that small. They, they march through that mask as if it doesn't even exist. Um, so, so, and some people say, yeah, but when you combine it with the saliva, there's some stoppage. Yeah, but, but it's not just being combined with saliva, one. And two, most of these masks aren't effective for viruses. Uh, actually, I, I erased my board. Uh, most of those masks that we're talking about that people are wearing are not effective. Now, if you want to go around with an N95, research shows if anything's effective, that that one would be. But again, not effective for a healthy individual. You have to understand what I showed you earlier was from 
uh, was from most major industrialized countries that realized that masks are not really an effective strategy. They're not really a disease stopping strategy. People that wear masks are on the front line that protect themselves. But if you're a citizen walking out in public, um, the mask is not going to do anything, especially if you're a healthy individual already. So, so again, I hope that, that helps you understand a little bit better. Uh, Greg wants to know what harm does a face mask have if worn for a long period of time? The biggest issue is the CO2, an aggressive elevation in CO2, but also an accumulation of uh, potential bacteria and moisture around your face that could serve as a breeding ground. Uh, remember, what else loves to grow in these moist, wet masks is mold, mold contamination. So if you're not replacing your mask on a very regular basis, you're actually increasing your risk um, for those types of issues. Let's see, actually, um, yeah, Joni says, so, so they say, so who do we believe? Everyone says something different. You're right. That's why I showed you Fauci saying two different things. Uh, again, I, and that's why I also showed you guys the research, kind of the summary of research as we know it on, on masks and whether they work. And the general consensus is that there's no great research or evidence that shows that masks work. And they've actually done studies of sick individuals trying to reduce the spread of viral or bacterial infections and have not been able to show any major great benefit for mask wearers versus non-mask wearers. So again, the research doesn't... It doesn't really support it. Uh, let's see. I, li I like this because Lori chimes in. Lori, I, Lori says, I worked in the OR 20 years and I believe that wearing a mask eight hours a day, five days a week, plus scrubbing my hands for five minutes for each surgery contributed to the downfall of my health. Thank you for sharing that, Lori. I mean, there's, a, there's an entire field of scientific evidence called the hygiene hypothesis, which means that when people become too clean and too focused on hygiene and germophobic, they actually increase the risk of developing autoimmune disease. And by the way, look at, look at autoimmune disease. It's, it's, it's rapidly increasing today. It's, 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 it's on a huge elevated trajectory right now, and in large part because of many of the practices um, that we have, germophobia being one of them. So, so Sandra wants to know, what do we do if work requires us to wear a mask? If work is requiring you to wear a mask, then you present them with evidence that says that, look, for you to wear that mask puts your health at risk. And uh, if they're willing to pay for your medical bills as a result of that forced mask, um, generally what will happen is they'll make an exception for you. I've, I've seen this happen a number of times with a number of people. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so some of you talking about, yeah, I mean, so, so the mask has the perception of, I, I'll say, pseudo-safety. People see other people wearing masks and they, they feel better about it. They feel safe. They feel safe because they're scared, right? And again, when we make bad decisions... It's when we use our limbic brain when we make decisions out of fear. And so all these people that are in a fear mode, they're, it's, like, it's like a baby who's sucking on a nipple, um, feels safe and feels warm and fuzzy. People seeing other people wear masks who are living in that fear mode feel this, I call it pseudo safety because they feel safe, but it's not really any safer. So they're not really safer than they were with or without the mask. It's just a, a sense of things. And so in that regard, if in their brain they feel safer, then they actually are safer. Like you, you create your own reality through what you think. Now, my advice to people that want everyone else to wear masks to accommodate their fear, those individuals need to go home and stay home and, and, uh, and quit trying to dictate or control the movements and the, and the um, operations of other individuals. Remember, we all have freedom. We all have the freedom in the freedom of choice. And you have the freedom and choice to stay home as much as you do to get out into the grocery store, etc. Let's see, do people with Hashimoto's have more challenging time fighting COVID? Not generally, not if you just have like Hashimoto's. Now, if you have uncontrolled Hashimoto's and other comorbidities uh, along with the Hashimoto's, so like if you have other autoimmune conditions, then potentially yes. Now, Hashimoto's in and of itself, if you're, if you're 
thyroid numbers are being well medicated or well controlled with nutrition, diet, and lifestyle, then no, it's not really one of those types of conditions where we'd say you have a, a greater risk or a greater degree. So Dory wants to know, can I give links showing studies that masks are ineffective? Well, I put some of those up for you today already, Dory, but yes, what we'll do if you're on our YouTube channel, we'll put those in the show notes for you to follow. So if you want to go um, read more information about masks and mask studies, you'll have that information that you can access. Uh, let's see. What about the children? <laughs> oh man, so Ginger wants to know, what about these children getting this sickness now, giving them heart attacks? So what have they been like a dozen? Not very many, we're not talking about a lot and nobody's really ruled out or ruled in that it's actually COVID causing it. Remember that Kawasaki's disease has a, a normal incidence and prevalence and so we're not saying that COVID is causing that, we're just saying uh, there's very loose connection and not very good research on this. And I think this is just another one of those elements where the media is trying to inject more fear into the population um, with, without any great scientific evidence to back up what they're really saying. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at this whole connection between COVID and Kawasaki's disease as, a, as something that you would you know, shelter your children in place even more because that's what a lot of parents are doing. Let's see, back that up, there we go. So Grace wants to know, Dr. Osborne, do you have any advice for heavily dependent disabled people like me, uh, also a victim of domestic violence? Healthy or heavily dependent, so if you're heavily dependent disabled, you, you know, you know that's a tough situation, Grace. I, I'd maybe look at if you have other family members that, can, that you might be able to be with or stay with um, if, if, if at home you're in, indeed a victim of current domestic violence. If you're not currently a victim of domestic violence, but were a victim in the past, of course, the first thing you need to do if you're a victim of domestic violence is get out of the violent situation, protect yourself. And I would say that there's a far greater risk of domestic violence potentially killing someone than there is of COVID-19. Um, so, so get out of you know get out of that domestic abusive situation. That would be step one. And there are a number of, of different shelters, women's shelters, and, and charitable groups that might have the ability to help you in that regard. Okay. Why are so many people dying? Um, People have been dying, people died last year. If we actually compare death rates from last year to this year, they're not really all that different. And that's kind of one of the, the myths, or I should say one of the, the falsities that's being propagated is that somehow COVID's killing more people uh, and, that, and that we have an exaggerated or exorbitant amount of deaths when in reality, we, we, you know, when this is all over, like what we saw in Italy where the, where the health minister in Italy came out and, and admitted that 88% of the COVID deaths were actually not caused by COVID. People with COVID die, but that doesn't mean that COVID caused their death. And that's a very, very important scientific distinction to make because you can't blame the disease for killing somebody if it wasn't the cause of their disease. If a person has been abusing their body and they're diabetic and they're already going to have a heart attack and COVID comes along and it's the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back, it doesn't mean that it's a COVID-related death. It means that they've abused their bodies to such a great degree that it didn't matter whether they got COVID or influenza next, that was the thing that was going to take them out. And that's not the same thing as the cause of death. But, but the death rates have not really changed all that much from last year to this year, including COVIDs, which leads us to believe that there's some false statistical manipulation going on. And we already know that's true. I mean, I, I showed you, I think, a clip a couple of weeks ago where Dr. Burks uh, was saying we're taking a very liberal approach to to counting COVID deaths. We're calling things that COVID, we're calling deaths that weren't really caused by COVID, COVID deaths. I mean, she came out and said it. It was, you know, right in front of all of America. Look it up. Um, you know, and statistical manipulation like that is very dangerous because it creates fear. It creates fear, which then creates 
action steps by our government, by the different entities that we, you know, again, that we voted in to govern us. And if they're basing their decision making process based on false numbers, then crimes against people's businesses and livelihoods are, are occurring. And they actually are occurring as we speak. They're uh, crimes against people's ability to have freedom and earn, a, and earn a livelihood. And I know a lot of people are saying, well, that's so selfish, you know, that capitalism shouldn't take precedence over lives. No, no, lives are important. So a person's ability to pursue an income and to pursue the ability to take care of their family and put food on their table and to pay for their rent, that does affect their livelihood and it does affect their life because we're going to see suicide rates dramatically track up. We already have started to see that. We're seeing domestic violence reports increase. In my city alone, the, you know, some of my friends that uh, run apartment businesses have been told by the police that the police will no longer respond to a call unless there's a gun involved. So the police are so busy babysitting COVID diagnostic tents. And there's no lines in these tents, by the way. If you drive by them Monday through Friday when they're open from nine to four, there's nobody in line. But there's six police cars, a fire truck. So we're using all these resources to have these COVID diagnostic tents set up and nobody's getting diagnosed because First of all, people don't want to go get a diagnosis. They'd rather just shelter in place or stay at home if they're sick, which is a smart thing to do. But they're taking our law enforcement off the street and taking them away from their jobs to babysit a COVID tent, which is a ridiculous notion when the hospitals are laying off employees and you have plenty of hospitals, doctors and nurses that could take care of these people, but they're just not allowing it. This whole thing has been mismanaged to an extreme level because of the fear, because of the false statistics and the false information that's been being propagated. And so you have to understand that the false information that is being used for politicians to make decisions is creating bad decision making that is just creating a domino effect that's affecting and impacting all of our lives to the negative. And so, and so again, all, all these things are important and you have to think about them. Can you, uh, Cheryl wants to know, can you explain being asymptomatic again, please? So, so an asymptomatic maybe is what you meant, Cheryl, but, but you could have a positive COVID test, what they call an asymptomatic carrier, but it doesn't mean you're a carrier of the disease that you're going to spread the disease. What it means is you probably already had contact with it and you've created antibodies against it. Again, the, the testing for this has been, has been very non-scientific, and even the person that developed the test says this test is not designed to actually diagnose COVID-19. So, so again, a lot of the problems in the statistics that are being reported with the false testing or the, I should say, the non-scientific testing or the inaccuracies of the testing, however you want to put the words, um, but it's, it's testing that's creating false fear, false numbers, false elevations. Uh, people, doctors are reporting deaths that aren't really being caused by COVID. So, we, you know, we have this whole scenario where it's all been fear driven and in large part money driven. And so you're destroying people's businesses and livelihood and lives as a result of these fear based decisions. And some of these states, like Cal, if you live in California, I'm praying for you because, you know, what they're doing in that state to me, if I lived in California, I'd be marching on the Capitol today. Um, anyway, high blood pressure increases your risk of COVID-19 for several reasons, Gail. Uh, one of the biggest reasons many of the medications being used to treat high blood pressure in, increase the expression of ACE2. ACE2 is a receptor on the surface of the cell that is where COVID enters your cell. So COVID enters into your cell through a door called ACE2 and many of these blood pressure medications drive up the production of ACE2 receptors and so make you more susceptible to, to picking up the, the virus. Okay. Why does the media keep telling us that they are fast tracking a vaccine if, if their timeline is unrealistic? And what about the compounds they're using? Could they not be just as dangerous to the public? Yeah, my whole point is, look, if you're waiting at home for a vaccine, look at this track record and the safety record of vaccines as it exists. I mean, the vaccine injury courts pay out uh, millions and millions of dollars of vaccine injuries every year. And, and uh, if you look at, like, for example, the safety or efficacy of, of if we're just looking at viral infection, influenza, you know, the, the virus... Uh, the influenza virus, the vaccine for that at best on best years has a 40% efficacy. And that's really an exaggeration of efficacy. So don't hide in your house waiting for a solution that isn't going to come. It doesn't make sense. I mean, look at the, just look at the track record. And when you fast track a vaccine without proper safety, 
and you and you declare that everybody should get it as a result of an emergency situation and again the emergency situation is based on false numbers you see how this is affecting you if you're not standing up and you're not demanding accountability from your politicians and from your city government from your local government from your state government you know you should be that we you should all be advocating right now for your rights and not living in fear of the government mandating something over you. The government doesn't control you, you control the government. That's a message that you should take away from the show tonight. Um, so all that Matthew wants to know, are you hearing about the viral effects of more cardiac in nature, i.e. blood clotting and less respiratory in nature? That's negative. Yeah, I mean, these are all, again, these are all part and parcel data. So does the virus affect, for, just like gluten, gluten for some people is going to affect their guts, for some people it's going to affect their brain, for some people it's going to affect their nerves or their joints. It's different for different people and I think this virus is very much the same, especially as it has the ability to morph and change over time. I think, I think more than anything we should be thinking about not necessarily ventilators or respirators, but we should be thinking about nutrition. And sunshine again. These are the things. Now, now, if somebody actually has the active disease, there are research studies, and I've talked about these ongoing on IV vitamin C. There are research studies on on zinc uh, that are that are showing promise. So again, you can go and you can read those studies. A lot of them are being done on COVID patients now and showing very, very good results. Um, so I, I worry less about the style of symptoms that a person develops and more about what you can do once they develop it or what you should do to prevent the development of it. When people say, I said, I love this question, Julie says, how do we respond when others tell us we're endangering grandma by going out, not wearing masks? You say, well, you're endangering me by not letting me go out and earn a living and earn an income and, and be functional in society. And, and grandma is important, but so am I. I'm not going to jeopardize my own freedoms and my own health for the sake of grandma. If grandma fears the virus, then grandma can self-quarantine. And, and that's okay, too. Uh, again, if you're living in that fear mode, I'm not judging you. You need to stay home. If you're in fear that you're going to catch this thing or if your health is in deterioration where you, f where you feel like you're going to have a higher risk of catching this thing, you're the one that needs to self-quarantine. You don't quarantine healthy people. This has never been done in the history of mankind that we know, quarantining healthy people to prevent disease. And it obviously, it doesn't do a whole lot because the curve is flattened. The disease wasn't as bad as we thought it was. Again, and I think a lot of the decisions that have been made and a lot of the action steps that have been taken were taken out of fear and not necessarily taken out of intelligent thinking. Okay, let's see here. Does glutamine or NAC affect mTOR? The question is aimed at maintaining autophagy during fasting. Boy, that's an off-topic question. Um, not to my knowledge. I haven't seen any research that shows glutamine or NAC affecting mTOR uh, in any dramatic uh, or major way. I would say more than anything, fasting is probably the one, of the, one of the best impacts uh, that you can get on mTOR. Let's see here. <laughs> so somebody's asking, are they in cahoots with China? I don't know if they're in cahoots with China. I, don't, I think there's a lot we're not going to learn out of this. I think there's a lot of behind the scenes uh, information about all this that um, we'll never really truly know the answer. I mean, master politicians are great at, at deflecting your attention and hiding the truths, and I don't think we'll ever see the full truth of this come out. I hope we do. I, what I really hope more than anything else is I hope that we see accountability. Uh, I hope we see the citizens uh, hold their politicians accountable for their behaviors during this time, because many of the politicians have taken draconian measures for something that um, that they shouldn't have. And I, and I hope we see those people get voted out. I hope we see those people be held accountable for the damage and the destruction of lives they've caused post uh, post virus. Yeah, so question for you guys. How many of you would get a vaccine if it came out? Um, how many of you say yes or no? How many of you would get a vaccine if it came out? Uh, Tammy wants to know, um, what about using elderberry and zinc to boost immune function? Zinc and elderberry have a lot of research studies on uh, immune function. None of them, though, have been on COVID-19. 
So you certainly can use elderberry and zinc, although you know it, it, you wouldn't be using them under the auspice that there have been research that proves that uh, they're going to be effective for COVID-19. So you know, read into that what you will. So I like what John says. He says these mandates are not law. The powers that be are just wanting to see how many liberties they can take away. And I, I, I absolutely, I want to reemphasize that, John. Thank you for bringing that up. These mandates that governments are putting out are not law, and you are not obligated to legally follow them. And these governors that are producing this draconian um, impact have no legal right or legal authority to do so, not even under emergency measures. They don't have the ability to change law, and they don't have the ability to... to I've seen some states where they're going to fine people. They have no ability to create fines for breaking a law that doesn't exist. And the only way that they're going to be able to extrapolate that fine is if you allow them to do that as a people. So again, most of you, well, I think pretty much all of you are saying no vaccine. So I think we know who we're talking to tonight. We're talking to some smart folks. Okay. Well, guys, we've gone over time tonight. I hope that, uh, I hope that this conversation helped shed a little bit of light on whether or not uh, masks are necessary. And uh, please do me a favor because we've got to educate a lot of people. We've got to make sure that the rest of the world gets on board with the fact that we can put the masks down and quit creating or leading or lending toward this fear mindset because it's this fear-driven mindset that's driving this thing forward. And it's going to drive it forward into October with a second wave if we don't squash it now. So again, Help share this information. Help get it out there. Share it with somebody. You know, tag it, paste it, uh, and forward it on, and let's get the rest of the world educated and up to speed. Look, I'm wishing you all excellent health. We'll see you next week for another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Have a great week. got a functional medicine or health question that you'd like me to answer for you, make sure you send me an email, glutenology at gmail.com, and we'll do our best to create a video answer just for you. Have a great day.